1 Peter chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. We'll bring you on. If you have a Bible, at, if you do not have a Bible at home or whatever, take this with you. Otherwise, just kind of leave it so we can use it again. But it's 1 Peter. It's a Bible from us. It's page 657. 1 Peter chapter 3. And today, we look at verses 8 through 17. And 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, begins with the phrase, to sum up. Some of your translations will say, finally. Now, as somebody who's teaching, um, that, that well, I, I guess I can cut a couple of different ways. But when I read it and then put the lesson together and then worked through the lesson, th those are kind of words you cringe at because what, what he's told you is, we're going to talk about all the stuff we just talked about. We're going to take everything here and try to tie it together. In this case, what Peter's doing is, is taking a section that probably technically begins at chapter 2, verse 13. I'd, I'd expand it to, to verse 12. And, and runs, runs arguably at least through this section, verse 15, 16, 17. This, this lesson today is kind of tucked in between four lessons and then pulling them together and then the next three or four. If you have your study guides or if you looked at the study guides, the suffering becomes the discussion topic for this week, next week, and the following week. And, and teaching, that's, that's sometimes hard. I feel and felt like, as I was preparing it, that this is very familiar territory. So hopefully I feel like that. I'm fearful you will. Uh, it's on suffering, and I, and I said, Peter may have you people in mind when he wrote this, based on the fact you have to listen to me uh, unpack all of this. It, it, but it, but it's, it's really helpful, it's really good, and it's really practical. He's not ending a section, but he's, but he's or ending the letter, but he's tying kind of the end of this thought process. So it began back in, as I said, chapter 2, verse 13, when he's talking about submit yourself to government, uh, chapter 2, verse 18, he was talking about slaves submit to your masters. So he's talking about government, workplace. And then what we looked at last week, chapter 3, verse 1 through 6, dealing with wives. Verse 7, dealing with husbands. So he's talking about family. So let's read it. Come back and we'll put it together. I'll tell you up front. I'll try to do application along the way. That's what my passion is, is getting this, understanding it, and then go, so what? But, I, but I'll tell you. That again, if this were a TV show, when we get to you know roughly 11:30, what would be on the screen would be to be continued, because this really does tie in. Tim and I were talking about it this morning. It, it, when you teach Paul, it, it feels like generally Paul kind of flows, makes a point, maybe a sub point. Peter just feels like he's popping around in some of this. It's not, but it it, it feels that way. So we were we were just talking about how difficult it is. I'm playing the sympathy card, maybe. How difficult it is to kind of try, you know, pull all this together. So hang in there with us as we do this. Verse 8, to sum up, all of you be, and then he lists five things, harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Now he paints the contract, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but, so we got a contrast when we see words like that, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for this purpose that you might inherit a blessing. And then he quotes from Psalm 34. For, so the four there is tying together verse 8 and 9. For the one who desires life and to love and to see good days, that's his way of describing a Christian, must, and four things, must keep his tongue free from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it for the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and the ears attend to his prayers but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good and even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness you are blessed do not uh, fear their intimidation do not be troubled but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with reverence, I'm sorry, with gentleness and reverence. Keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame 
That seems to be a thought that we've seen, seen along the way. Verse 17, for it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. So in my little feeble way, with my first blush through, I made five observations that, that tie this together, and, and that are in, I think, this passage, but certainly tie together these last three or four weeks. Number one, our belief affects how we will live. That's what Peter wrote back in chapter 2, verse 11. I urge you as aliens and strangers, I urge you to live, verse 12, to keep your behavior excellent. And here's the reason. So that in everything in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. So he's saying, because you believe this, live this way, and you need to understand, the second thing, my observation, that life brings with it a certain, a certain component of suffering. So this is a general discussion on suffering, but his focus, I think, really here is suffering for Christ's sake. There's general suffering just to life. I was talking to somebody this morning, and uh, we were talking, I just read an article uh, by a cardiologist, and he was, he was, this guy who was supposed to be some sort of an expert, and he was talking about having, he, he was having a heart attack, and he didn't realize it. And he was talking, and he, as he talked, it's like this is the stuff I have every day. And he was saying, I had this, and I kind of, am I getting old? I'm only 48. And, and, and I, was, so I was talking to somebody this morning, and just the, the wear and tear of life. My knee hurts. Is it related to something else? So there's, there's suffering, just the wear and tear of life. The third one is, is, is that faith may bring suffering to you. He writes in a way that seems to acknowledge that there were people that Peter's writing to who are already suffering. They're already uh, uh, suffering for the faith. Some of their family friends perhaps have been martyred. You may or you may not suffer. You may suffer. They estimate about 250,000 people, so a quarter of a million people a year are killed for their faith, so in 2012 still. So in all likelihood, not going to be you. you. You may suffer, and it may be as simple as you have some friends who won't hang with you because of your faith or something in between. My, my fourth observation is this, is that people are watching. So he's saying, here comes the persecution, but even they are watching how you respond to it. The minute you walk around with one of these Bibles, and the minute you tell the, the guys in the office or the people at the gym or, or the guys at school, and, and they go, what would you do yesterday? And you say, I was in church. The minute you say that, they're watching you. And I'll give you a secret. Here's a secret. And they're going to hold you to a standard, and it's going to be a standard that's higher than the standard you have for yourself. The one thing I know about you is you'll give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Okay? I'm pretty confident of that. But they aren't going to do that. But, but Peter's whole, whole idea is they're going to watch you and see God at work in you. And then the, the fifth thing is, is your response may or may not be used by God to attract people to, to himself to attract the people to Christ. It's what we saw last week in chapter 3, verse 1. In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of your wife. So you need to understand that. That's a, a, a general kind of sense in which Peter's coming back to again and again and again. It's something we try to keep in front of you all the time, that, that our privilege is to make the invisible God visible and speak the truth boldly. Yeah, there should be a steady flow. I'll make this point today two or three times. There should be a steady flow of people. I don't know what that means, by the way. But there should be a, a, a constant flow of people in your life. I don't know what that means in terms of frequency. Who are coming to you or are saying, there's just something different about you. Not odd, but different. And so we'll, we'll talk about, especially in light of suffering. So he's going to talk about our attitude in this, how we respond to it. Look, look at verse 8. To sum it up, all of you, and, and he's talking to us, five things, five characteristics. Number one, be harmonious. It's unity of spirit, some of your translations might say. It, it means literally same think. Our minds should be the same. It's not that Christianity is one size fits all. It's not that. It's not that we're all going to react and all, all be the same in terms of life. 
but there is at its core unity around the gospel. That, that what draws us together and, and causes us to be, as, as Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1, to, uh, verse 27, to be one in spirit and one in mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And this is the third week that I've had the, the cards in front of you. Tim taught from this two weeks ago. I, I was telling you last week, they were around. We had people by the doors. If, if you don't have these yet, and maybe you just have one of them, if you have one, you need more. So you can have one in your Bible and one that you can keep on the refrigerator. And, and on the one side is just what we're going to do in terms of the building. That's not as important. It's important, but it's not as important as the essential elements for a strong church. That's this side. There's six of them. We're going to devote a whole series to this and when we, right after the first of the year. And these are, the, these are the unity we have around God's word and prayer and evangelism and a biblical community and serving the church and generosity. There should be a, a harmony, a a same thoughtness, a unity in Christ. The uh, second word that he gives us is there should be sympathetic. Uh, it, it's the idea here of uh, sharing the same feeling. So we had a president here not too long ago who said, I feel your pain, and I always contended he could feel the pain because he caused most of it in my life, it felt like anyway. Okay? But that's what it means. It means to feel your pain. And pe people are longing for, there was a survey there, a lot of the exit poll stuff was really interesting, and, and, and not trying to get into politics at all, just what are people looking for, but something like, we're talking about president, that, that something like 25% of them wanted a president that could understand them, 19% wanted a president that was a leader, Okay. I don't know what that means, but it tells me we're in a new... My dad, again, talking about my dad, I don't remember my dad ever thinking, boy, I wish the president understood how I felt. Uh, you know, I, don't, I don't think he ever... It, never, he would have never, it would never even occurred to him to say you're not meeting my needs. Now, it, he, we might have been a better family if he would have. I don't know. But my word... My word this idea of, 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 of sympathy. He's saying, here's what I want you to see is I want you to be sympathetic to those around you. And, and one of the authors makes a point, even those who don't know you. I, I remember sitting with Larry Wright uh, at uh, First Watch. So we're at about 5th, 4th Avenue and Thomas. And he said, well, you know, what are you, what are you going to do today or yesterday? And I told him about a meeting I had the day before, a meeting that day, with, with two couples whose marriage was falling apart. And I just started, oh, he just started talking about it. And he just began to cry. Right? That's how tender his heart was, especially in this area, is that we can't be insensitive, we can't be indifferent. That there's a world of hurt around us. I, I think of this, and, and again, I, I don't, and people seem to be very gracious when I talk about it, but I think of it particularly of those that are weakest in the culture. So when I think of weakest in the culture, part of me goes to immigration, but, but the big part of me goes to abortion. There's no one weaker in the culture than the unborn. They have no voice. And we're equal opportunity killers in that area. We don't spend a lot of time, whether it's male or female, we take about 1.234 million babies a year and kill them. And, then we need, and we live with that. But the argument also is, gosh, you're worried about the unborn. You're not that worried about those that are born. Immigration is one of those issues. It's a difficult issue. You know that. It's, it's made more complex by the government's failure to deal with it. The Republicans want cheap labor and the Democrats want votes. There's a little cynicism there, but, but it's pretty close to being true. So they haven't dealt with it. And then you all, understandably, get all stirred up and say, what part of illegal don't you understand? To which I can come back and say, that's fine, but what part of love your neighbor don't you understand? Are you really going to take somebody that's, that's really legitimately hurting? And especially as God, and this is what happens in anything. But guys, I'll give you a chip. If you've got a wife or a girlfriend that you want, to get, you want to get her interested in sports, then what you do is hook her up biographically with these guys. Let them understand who the players are, their story, their family. What's well, real easy when you don't know anything but what Joe tells you about immigrants to go, uh, what part of illegal? But then you meet a couple of these kids. You meet the kid that's the honor student at one of the charter schools, and you realize he's illegal. 
He'd have anything to do with it. His mom and dad came up when he was two. He doesn't know any country but this. He doesn't even speak Spanish. What are you going to do with that kid? And it's not enough, I don't think, to just say, what part of illegal don't you understand? What part of hurting don't you understand? You're gonna, are you going to take that kid that comes into the food bank and find out if he's, got, if he's got papers before you give him food? Seriously? It's not, it's not simple. It's a complex issue. I got it. But, but I, we, need to guard our, we need to guard our hearts and not just be persuaded by some perhaps superficially simple solution. Third, brotherly. It's, it's affection toward people who are closely related. There's a wonderful example of the life of a guy that you don't typically think is this soft, gentle, mushy guy. His name is Paul. It's in Acts chapter 20. And he's saying goodbye to the elders at Ephesus. Now, my argument would be that was his favorite church. He would spent three years there. He's saying goodbye to them. And Luke writes this in Acts 20, verse 36. When he said these things, he knelt down and he prayed with them. And he began to weep aloud and embraced Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they were accompanying him to the ship. And I get in my mind and this, this idea of them at the ship and, and how hard it is to say goodbye. I never had to, my, my, both of my daughters live geographically, you know, here in town. So when we say goodbye, you know, it's goodbye. But even then, even then with, the, with the kids, I mean, Susan was awesome in that, in that goodbye was often a difficult thing for the kids. They didn't want to go home. So she would turn it into a game. She would stand in front of the car and she'd wave like this and they'd wave back. But I don't have those moments where you're giving them a kiss goodbye and saying, I'm not going to see you again for a year. The closest I can think of my, my, my grandpa. And he was kind of a crotchety old dude anyway. And, and, but, but you, you know, grandpa was coming. They'll be here about one. We'd be out in the front yard at 1230 waiting for him. And, you know, he's driving 37 miles an hour. And they get there about five at night for dinner and, and you know. And then he'd stay, and he never, and he, and he didn't, you know. Yeah, I would hang with him, and he he take me out of the. There was one bar in town that sold the tobacco that he chewed, so we'd go down there, and he'd get a beer, and I'd get it. Probably wasn't the best way to raise a kid. You don't need to email me on this. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm 12. I'm not drive. I'm not driving the engine here. Okay. Then I'd get a coke, and he'd get a beer, and he'd get his little, little key key chew. That's what he used to be, the little blue can. And I just remember when he'd leave, we'd be standing up for him, he'd just kind of wave. And, and I watched my It didn't occur. I, I know this is stupid. It didn't occur to me that this was my mom's mom and dad that she was saying goodbye to and how tough that was. And we'd wave. That's what I see here in Acts 20. I'd see him all the way down to the boat and finally I'd go, listen, Paul, you got to go. I don't want to go. You got to go. And then he'd get on that boat and then he'd pop right up and wave. There's that love. There's that, that, that familial side. And then the, the word is, is kind-hearted. It, it refers to internal organs. Sometimes it's translated, this idea, is tra tra the, this root word in the Greek, translated bowels or intestines. Uh, to, the, to the Greeks, those, those intestines, those inside, were a sign of courage. To the Christian, it was a sign of great affection. Uh, my daughter was in here first hour, and she wrote me a note and said, I love you with my intestines my intestines, the <laughs> smiley face. It's that kind of tenderheartedness. It's, a, it's an understanding. It's a powerful feeling. It's, it's affections and emotions that have a, a visceral, strong, strong language. And then the last one is humble in spirit. Uh, MacArthur writes this sentence. This is something that, that I've been working on uh, in my mind, just kind of mulling through. It, st it all started only time I've been in the hospital in my life. It all started when I was in the hospital in March. And I had a, a little bit of time that night to think about some stuff. And it's the first time ever I'd seen Susan go through it. But it's the first time I ever had that stupid kind of little gown on. And, and it wasn't so much humbling as humiliating. Um, but it had me thinking about this word. Now, listen to this sentence because you're, you're going to own it again 
uh, I think three or four weeks from now we get to chapter five and I'm teaching that day and, and I plan to spend a whole bunch of time on this idea. Here's what, here's what MacArthur writes. Humility is arguably the most essential, all-encompassing virtue of the Christian life. And, and, and that sentence really resonates with me because that's a conclusion I've drawn. I just don't know if I have the courage or the ability or the, the scholarship to make that sort of an all-encompassing, sweeping, definitive statement. But So I'll let MacArthur do it. Okay? Let me read it again. Humility is arguably the most essential, all-encompassing virtue in the Christian life. Now, the way I landed there is probably different than how John got there, but how I landed there is simple, simply uh, thinking about what, what C.S. Lewis writes in Mere Christianity when he says pride is the utmost evil. So if pride is the utmost evil, then the virtue that's going to correspond with this is, is humility, which I would argue is very closely related to love. And it's probably at the key part of love. So that's what I'm going to try to talk about in three or four weeks. But it's humble in spirit. It's, it's an attitude. It, it's, it's an attitude of submission. It's all the things we've been talking about. So one author closes the section this way. The joys of their life in Christ are maximized when believers are united in truth and life with one another. Peaceful in, in disposition. Gracious toward each other who need the gospel, sensitive to the pains of fallen sinners and sacrificial in their love, loving service to all, compassionate instead of harsh, and above all, humble like their Savior. So that's what Peter offers us in uh, chapter 3, verse 8. He said, here's, here's what I don't want you to do. Don't return evil for evil or insult for insult. There, there may be those times where, and I would argue, that's just normal life. That, that's, that, that's just normal life. We're going to have people who are going to say things about me. have nothing to do with your faith. You know, it may be because you're this odd little kid and everybody else is cool. It, it may be that, that you have whatever it is. It's, it's your background. It could be the way you look or what you wear. But he's saying in the midst of this, there's, there's going to be some mistreatment. He's not quite to suffering for your faith yet, though it could be part of that for sure. But there's going to be times when we're tr trusting God and, and trusting him for the care that he has for us and his provision for us. And in the midst of this, when those difficult times come, again, whether they're for Christ's sake or not, I, I don't want you to respond. If they're evil against you, don't be evil. If they speak against you and revile you and insult you, don't, don't respond that way. Now, I'll go back and take it for the faith. Here's the illustration I always think of. It's in uh, Matthew's Gospel when we come to this point or come to the definition of, of meekness. It's Matthew's Gospel, verse, uh, chapter 27. And uh, verse 33, they have arrived at the place of crucifixion. Jesus is nailed to the cross. His garments are divided. Verse 37, they put the charge over him. This is Jesus, Jesus king of the Jews. And then starts this scene. And I, this scene has always been gripping to me. At that time, two robbers... Matthew 27, 38. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right, one on the left. And, and those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads, and they're saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in th three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him, saying, he saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. Now, there's no reason for what I'm about to say, but for whatever reason, when I go through and I read that, that's like that moment where if I was Jesus, it feels to me like it would be the tipping point. It, it feels to me like at that point I'd go, come here. Okay, let me loosen these nails. Bop! It, 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 I, 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 there's something in me that seems to be like over there. And if ever, here you are, beaten, battered, physically, mentally. He doesn't revile. 
His conclusion is, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Our tendency is to say, okay, I, here's what I'm, <laughs> somehow we're going to get even here. Isn't that, isn't that the way the world says it? Isn't that what we say? I don't get mad, I get even. Get even. You're, you're in Matthew's gospel. Just go to the right a letter, a little to the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 12, there's actually a section here that ties together almost everything we've looked at in the last three or four weeks and this lesson as well. Paul is, is past that pivot point. In Romans 12, 1, so lots of application. And, and he says this, chapter 12, verse 14. He says, bless those who persecute you and do not curse. Now, I didn't go that far in, in 1 Peter, but that's the very next thing. He says, do not return evil for evil or insult for evil, but give a blessing instead. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. There's that whole idea of sympathetic understanding and love. And I think the order is significant. It's, it's far easier to weep with those who weep than rejoice with those who rejoice. It, it, as, as people in, in your life begin to tell you some of these gut-wrenching stories, I'm watching that. I'm, uh, Sandy and I are watching that, that show on Arlington Cemetery last night, and it's just very hard to sit there and not have your, your eyes tear up and your, your heart be broken. There was, there was a, a, little, a little lady, and she was there, and um, it was her only son who died. And I, I can't I think it was 24 or 5. And she was saying, she said, he always told me, Mom, you should have had more kids. And as she's there, he happened to, she happened to be an African-American lady. As she's there, up comes, there's a bunch of, of pledges from Annapolis, and, and they do different projects, and part of it was this was their day to, to come to Arlington, and here comes this young guy, and all of a sudden, she recognizes him. It was, it was really cool in terms of just a color issue. He was white, and she embraces him, and it ends up totally random. It was, his, it was his, her son's best friend. It was just this amazing time, and it was that moment. You're like, you got to be And I kept saying to Sandy, this is killing me. This is so sad, encouraging and sad. It's very easy to weep with them. But it's not so easy to rejoice with those who are rejoicing. It's pretty easy if the guy in the next cube comes in and says, my seven-year-old has cancer. Pretty easy to weep with him. Not so easy to rejoice when he says, give me five, I'm the new manager. It's not so easy there. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Don't be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Don't be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. Now, it's not going to be possible. Some people it's impossible to get along with. But he's saying to the best of your ability, you remove your contribution to the dispute. And then here's the part I like. Never take your revenge, beloved. Leave room for the wrath of God. I'm going, wow, this is the greatest payback of all. I can sleep at night because I'm not harboring bitterness and God's going to get them. <laughs> Vengeance is mine and I will repay, says the Lord. Well, that's the sentiment minus, I guess, the fleshly godly revenge that i want that that's the sentiment that peter's expressing chapter three back to first peter verse nine you were called for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing you you were called to to suffer you were called to to bless and you bless them in a variety of ways you pray for people you pray for your enemies you share the faith with them you love them the best that you can unconditionally and you forgive them. There was that incident recorded in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 18, where Peter comes to Jesus and, and basically says, how often should I forgive my brother's sin? Seven times? And remember, Jesus' response is, no, it's 70 times seven. Well, is Jesus saying 490? No, he's giving a picture here. You just forgive. Charles Spurgeon says, the gospel that we believe, the gospel is a gospel of giving and forgiving. 
Paul's writing in Ephesians chapter 4, and again, it's that pivot point of that epistle where he's now applying, applying, applying. And he, and he says, you know, in essence, put off the old, put on the new. And he gets to the end and he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger, rage, clamor, slander, let him be gone for you. Be kind. Same idea here, same idea of kind-hearted, tender-hearted toward one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God has forgiven you. We ought to be the world's greatest forgivers because we understand how much has been forgiven in our life. I struggle with lots of different things, but forgiveness is not one of them. I remember when I, when I read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, I said, wow, now that makes sense. If I stop and I go, listen, here's who I was, and God saved me anyway, how am I then going to hold a grudge against somebody else? We should be the world's greatest forgivers. It's a, it's a blessing, he says. And then he quotes from Psalm 34. The one who desires life and to love and to see good days, he's talking to those of us who are Christians, he, he says, if, if that's us, and he begins that verse with the word for, so he's kid, connecting verses 8 and 9. So if all that's true... We must keep our tongue free from evil and our lips free from speaking deceit. We're in 1 Peter. The book to the left, the book of James, has within it the longest contiguous passage in all of Scripture dealing with the topic of the tongue. It begins in chapter 3, verse 1, and, uh, you know, depending on how you divide it, at least till verse 12, and maybe all of chapter 3. And in the middle of this, James tells us, James 3, 6, the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. Every species of beasts and birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. And then he talks about it schizophrenic. On one hand, we bless, and on the other hand, we curse. Now, here's what Peter has in mind as he quotes from Psalm 34, is if we're truly going to be the men and women, students that God's called us to be, we have to get control of our tongue. And we have to not speak deceit, that's to, to lie, and then to turn away, turn away and, and with it, and this becomes an operative word for the next 20 minutes, 10 minutes. It, the idea of turn away connotes the idea of intensely, strongly rejecting what is sinful. Intensity becomes a, a passion in here. And, and to be driven toward that is, that is good. And he says, I want you to seek and pursue peace. Again, as one author describes, it conveys an intensity, an aggressiveness of action. Implicit in the phrase is the analogy of a hunter vigorously tracking down its prey. I need to hunt down, pursue, grab peace. MacArthur writes, Christians are to seek peace and hunt for it aggressively, even peace with their persecutors and those who don't know Christ. We are to be known as the peacemakers, those who strive for harmony with others as much as possible, and again, without compromising the truth. And there are certain things that in the world are just going to divide you when you take a stand. The gospel is incredibly divisive. When you begin to say to the friends around you that this is the way, the truth, the life, no one comes to the Father but through me, that's potentially very divisive. That's what I'm saying. He's saying you want to live at peace as much as you can. I had a long discussion with a restaurant owner one night. It was a wonderful guy, and I bop in that place and for maybe an hour or two once in a while. And uh, I was just coming home from uh, Braden's uh, birthday party and popped in and he said, gosh, I never see you in here, you know, this time of night. And I said, ah, normally I'm a, I'm a five, five to seven guy, I'm more of a happy hour guy than a retail guy. <laughs> and uh, well, he was talking about some different things and, and uh, we got talking about faith. And he said, let me ask you something. So it's, it's, this, is amaz this was amazing to me. So you can ask any question you want. What do you think he asked? 
He said, what would you say about homosexuality? I said, why don't you just pick something that would just rip us apart? And uh, so I said, well, I, I, I said, first of all, it doesn't matter what I say. Does the Bible speak to the issue? And I took him through it. He said, okay. He said, you know, I've been living with this girl now for six, seven, eight years. I know we're not married. He said, I know, I know you don't approve of that. And I said, well, you're celibate, right? He said, <laughs> well, no. And I said, oh, okay. Well, no, we wouldn't approve of that. So we had this, as you can see, and we went down this list. There were three or four or five topics like this. And we're all done. He said, you know what I love is I can have these conversations, and, and you never get argumentative with me. And I thought, gosh, have I, I wonder if I've soft-sold it. I wonder if I haven't been clear. And he's saying there's this whole idea of peace and seeking peace. That that ought to be a cornerstone of our life, not divisive. And we're in politics that are amazing divisive, divisive. And, and things are so polemic. And, and, I, and I, again, I, I, I'd argue it's, it's baked into the culture now. You turn on the ESPN in the morning and you get first take and you have two guys, Stephen A. Smith and somebody else yelling at each other about something in basketball. And that's like the way we communicate now. If you feel passionate, then you argue about it. And, and at the end of the day, that is not winsome. So I, I, those of you that are upset about the election and you want to win this thing, you better act in a winsome way. Our goal here, is, and this is why there's great freedom for us, is as we represent Christ and talk about Christ, we don't have to win anybody to Christ. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Our job is simply to present, present the truth in a way that's loving and understanding. And, and, and you ought to be able to look around and, and just, just sense, take the pulse of your relationships. If you're at war with the people around you, and every time you talk about this stuff, it becomes volatile and explosive. Okay, I get it. But just, is it you? And he gives him some comfort. Verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. The ears attend to their prayers. It's an Old Testament picture. It speaks of God's special, caring, watchfulness over his people. He said, on the other hand, the face of the Lord is against those who are doing evil. It's an Old Testament picture, again, of, of judgment. Here's what he's saying is God's, God's watching everybody. God understands everything. But to those of us who are Christians, he said, he sees everything that you do. One author writes, God is always fully aware of everything in the lives of his children. It ought to be a great incentive for believers to live as Peter is outlined, knowing that they can have confidence that the Lord is always watching and waiting and ready to hear and answer their prayer. Yeah, there's part of it, but if I don't have my correct thinking, that's a very scary proposition. He sees everything. Now, I find great comfort in that. I'm a direct TV guy now. Made the, I've been converted. It's my second biggest conversion of my life. Okay. And then, so now I have the red zone. Okay. Well, this is not a good thing for me. So there's four or five games. They're driving. You know, Broncos are ready to score. Cardinals are ready to score. Let's make it something as rare as the virgin birth, okay? Let's make it let's make rare. Let's make it something that happens every day. Cardinals are ready to score. You're flipping over. Well, well sometimes, sometimes I'm afraid we get the idea that God's in heaven with the red zone, and he missed that little thing that happened in your life. That that cancer snuck in while God was drifting away. That, that, that job got away. Just, just, oh, man, the Panthers are ready to score. Right? It's God's carried away. No, he sees everything. He understands everything. He has absolute control. R.C. Sproul, no maverick molecule loose in the universe that can usurp his plan. There's nothing that comes into your life that God doesn't cause or allow. That's what makes him God. And so I don't have to worry about it. This is an unbelievable thought to me, amazing thought to me. God loves me more than I love myself. And I will tell you, I love myself a lot. God loves me even more with a perfect love. And he says, you know what? Right now, you don't need that to go the way you want it to. You need a little suffering. You need a little pain. Why? Mm. We know what? What's the big answer? My good? 
his glory. Grow me, develop me. I, it, it's, it's, I think, important to, to realize the Peter who's writing about this and he's writing about suffering, he's writing about reviling. This is the, this is the Peter who said, I never knew him, I never knew him, I never knew him. Er, er, er. This is the Peter that wants to slash ears and he'll revile. And, Can we get him, God? But he goes closer to him, and all of a sudden he understands this, that there's great comfort in this. And we know God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and, uh, and uh, love him. And called according to his purpose. My mind just gif- shifted to verse 13 because there's a train there. There's a change there. He moves to a new section. And it becomes really the, the central part of the rest of this letter. He's going to talk about suffering. And again, it's in the, again the backdrop there of a, of a society that uh, Francis Schaeffer points out was filled with degradation and depravity and insults and assaults on the church. But even then, it might have been even more frequent than ours, but certainly the climate was not unlike the one we're in. And he, and he asks rhetorically, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good. The idea of prove is to become. A zealous has, again, the idea of an intensity. You're pursuing becoming what is good. Is there going to be opposition to that? There may be. But even then, we can deal with it because he says in verse 14, even if you should suffer, and suffer in this case for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. God is going to, to do great things in, through, in your life, even in the midst of this suffering. So don't fear their intimidation and don't be troubled. Verse 14, he said, even if you, the idea there is perchance or contrary to what's expected. You didn't anticipate that. He said, even in the midst of this, you, you need to understand that there's a blessing there. So what's the practical outgrowth? Of I don't need to be afraid. There should be nothing that we're afraid of. Now, let me, let me qualify it a little bit. If you're walking down the street and somebody jumps out and goes, boogie, 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 okay, you're going to jump. I'm not saying that. What he's saying is when something comes into your life and you have the opportunity to take inventory of it, you, there's a peace that passes all understanding. I, I, again, I was reading this cardiology stuff this week, and I don't know why. Somebody sent it to me. And it, and it looked right, sounded right. And he was talking about heart attacks. And, and I think, do I worry about having a heart attack? Well, I, and it's funny, I don't. If, but, I, but, I, but I worry about having something where for like 10 years, I'm, I don't want that. Put him up front again, that type of thing. And that's not to demean that. It's just that... that even then, when I take inventory and contemplate, I'm going, well, God put Sandy in my life, my kids in my life, and the family around me. And, and even if I'm in a state of total vegetation, God uses that for my good and his glory. So why, why, don't, there's no reason to be afraid. Don't fear fear is what he's saying. But sanctify Christ as Lord. That, that's somewhat of a strange word. We think of us being sanctified. It has with it the idea of being, being set apart. And he's saying, sanctify the Lord is to set him apart as the only holy one. I have no other God before him. It's an idea that's picked up from, the, from Isaiah in Isaiah 8. But sanctify the Lord in your heart. And we'll close with this idea. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that's in you. And yet do it with gentleness and reverence. This whole idea of give an account, it's the, the Greek word apologia, from which we get the English word apology or apologetics. It means, in, in this case, a formal judicial courtroom defense. So here's what he's saying. When you begin to submit to government and submit to the masters and submit to your husband and love your wife in a way that's contrary to the culture, people people are going to look at you and they're going to say, can you explain yourself to me? And, And that should be happening. I said it before. That should be happening on a frequent basis. They may not say it that way. They're going to say, I don't know how you do I don't know how you do it. 
If you have somebody who starts sentences with, I don't know how you do it, your response blows me away. I could never handle that the way you do. Okay? When you hear that, the little hairs on your neck should stand up, your little heart ought to begin to beat, and you ought to be going, this is it. This is the opportunity, because what they're asking is, what makes me tick? How can you handle that? How do you stay so calm? How do you love her when? How do you submit to him when? How do you handle that with your kids? How do you handle that at work? Calling all ten of us in to, to lay us off, and that's a scary proposition. And yet, not in a whistling through the graveyard mentality, but somehow in you, and it's not that it doesn't hurt, but you, you handle it differently, noticeably different, so they come to you and say, I want you to give an account of the hope that's in you. I, I want you to give me a word, a message. As people come and they go, what is that? And the hope within you is Jesus. Somebody uh, sent me some long Abraham Lincoln quote the other day. In the United States of America, the only hope for the world, blah, 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 blah. Okay, I love the country. Put me down for yes, big America guy. But the only hope for this world is not the United States of America. It's Jesus. And that's, I'm not trying to be some sort of self-righteous way. And that doesn't dismiss, by the way, the importance of politics, all that goes with it, because that's really important. But the hope that we have is Christ. The hope that I have is, if I lose this job, God has a provision for me. I don't know what it is. It's called faith and trust. And if you had every answer to every question, you wouldn't need faith and you wouldn't need to trust. To give a hope. It's the blind man. I love John 9. I love John 9. So Jesus walking into town. There are the disciples. There's the blind man. They say, well, who sinned, this man or his parents? Sin that, he, that he's blind. And, and Jesus goes, boys, neither one of them. But he might be a display case for the work of God. And that's what you and I, by the way, that's what all of us are. We're all spiritually blind. We can now see we're all display cases for the work of God. But then the story goes now with the blind man. Now the leaders want to come in there and they're, they're going to inquire about this. They go, wait a minute, what happened? And he said, ah, yeah, I don't know. Well, he made you see. How did he make you see? What? They put this in my eye and the rub, I can see. What, and here's what I say, I don't, here's what I know. I was blind, now I see. That's all I know. I may know more a little bit later, but that's all I know right now. And they come back to him and they stay on him. And finally he said, wait a minute, do you want to believe in him too? Well, no. That's not what we're looking for. Don't be intimidated when God puts you in that place. And the very fact that I can say God put you in that place should give you comfort. Where somebody around you is saying, man, I'm spitting. It's like Gallagher concert in the front row here. Um, <laughs> ah, spitting all over. When, somebody, when God puts you in this place where people are asking you, make a defense. What's going on? He'll give you the words you pray. All you do is pray. Father, give me the words. You said you would give me the words. And you don't... You don't have to come up with some fancy answer. You don't have to answer every question he has. What does a witness do? A witness simply tells what happened to them, what they saw. And you can say, I don't know. Here's what I do know. I was lost on my way to hell. Now I'm on my way to heaven based on, on belief in Jesus and the cross. Well, what about, I don't know. I'll have to get back to you some other day on that one. But the fact that he says, be ready, be ready. And the idea there is in a tense that, that implies a, a continued pre, uh, preparedness. Be ready to, to make a defense. Keep your conscience clear so that in the thing in which you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Keep your conscience clear. Behave in a way. Conscious about this sense of right or wrong. It's not perfect, but it's something that you have. We see it all the time. Somebody will come and they'll say, you know, I'd like some advice on something. And I'll say, well, what do, you, what do you think you should do? And almost always, their gut tells them the right thing. A lot of times, I'll stop and say, why are you asking about this? Well, something doesn't feel right. Well, do what's right so that you're not guilty, you're not accused. You'll see that happen. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what's wrong than doing what's right. It, it's, it's better not to be caught doing something wrong and suffer discipline, but to do what's right and suffer under God's hand of perhaps 
chastisement of those around you for your edification. So when they slander you, hurt you, they suffer. But it's to suffer for doing the right thing. As I said, if you remember back 45 minutes ago, maybe a little longer now, I said we'd reach the end and it would say on the bottom, to be continued. So this is exactly where we'll pick up with really the same thought of suffering, not next week only, but next week and the next two weeks. So Jake's going to come, lead us in our time of communion, close this time, and then our time of worship. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for this awesome truth. Thank you that we can know you, love you, worship you, serve you. God, knowing you does not mean that there isn't hardship in our life. In fact, it guarantees it. God, we don't say it in an arrogant way, but, but allow it to happen so that you can be glorified and we can draw closer to you. God, use us. We pray that in Christ's name. Amen.